Imagine it is the opening NFL game of the season. Ravens versus Chiefs this Thursday night. And you're playing on the Kansas City Chiefs team. And you're hoping to defend your title and become the first NFL team in history to win three back-to-back -back Super Bowls. The stadium is packed. The lights are bright. The energy is electric. And this is what you've been waiting for. This is what everyone's been waiting for. Uh, the, the first snap, the first tackle, the start of a brand new season, and potentially a season that leads to NFL history. Your team is going toe-to-toe, head-to-head. -to -head. Every play is a battle, and the crowd is on the edge of their seats, roaring with excitement. You can feel, feel the intensity, you can feel the passion and the adrenaline of the moment. But instead of being on the field, right in the thick of it, you find yourself on the stands. You're watching the action unfold, you're soaking in the atmosphere, but something is missing. You're not in the game. You're just watching from the sidelines. No jersey, no helmet, you're not even, you're not even holding the ball. You're part of the experience. You're even on the team, but you're not really part of the game. It's still fun and all but you know something is missing. You have this sense that you were, you were made for something more than just watching. And in many ways, this NFL game is how some of us approach our faith journey. And, and not that you're trying to get a three-peat, uh, which I don't know what that would look like in our faith journey, like with Jesus, I don't know what that means, but in, in relation where you know, you know that you should be a part of the, the game, you're part of the team, but something's, something's missing. You show up on Sundays. You, you enjoy sitting and, and, and participating in worship. You listen to the messages, but deep down, you feel like you're just part of the crowd. It's like we're involved, but we're not fully engaged. We're present, but we may not be participating in the way that we know that we could. And while that may feel comfortable for a time, there's often this stirring within us that we're meant for something more. And that's because we are meant for something more. We are created to be in the middle of the action, to be fully engaged, to be making a difference. So today we're going to be looking at what it looks like to be all in with Jesus. Because when we go all in, when we move from being a spectator to becoming a participant, when we get off the sidelines and, and get into the game, when we pick up the ball and step into our true purpose, that's what it looks like to be all in. And we'll discover that there is joy and fulfillment that comes from being a vital part of something that is bigger than ourselves. So what does it look like to be all in with Jesus? Well, I think it'd be appropriate to turn to what Jesus said and what Jesus did as he provided us the perfect example of what it means to be all in. We're going to be in John chapter 13, and we're going to see this moment that would have stunned everyone in the room. Jesus, he knew he had all authority on heaven and earth, and he chose to do something that was unthinkable. He knelt down, and he began to wash his disciples' feet. We pick it up in verse four. So he, referring to Jesus, got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then after he washes his disciples' feet, Jesus does something and he really, actually he says something <laughs> that should make all of us think and potentially reflect he says in verse 12, it says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. It's like he's saying, okay, you've, you've got the answers right to the test. Like you, you have your right thinking, your right information in place. You've got the right theology about Jesus himself, but but right theology isn't enough. He goes on and says, now that I, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you should also wash one another's feet. I've set an example. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Do as I have done for you. And then later in verse 34 and 35, he says, a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this you will know you are, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Like I can picture Jesus sitting there with his disciples saying, you guys, come on, followers, disciples, guys, listen to this. This is what it's about. Yeah, you're going to grow in your faith. Yeah, you're going to grow in your understanding about who I am and what I'm doing. Yeah, you're going to teach people about me. People are going to read your writing and about your lives and they're going to know me more. In fact, generations upon generations will know because of what you say. You're going to do amazing things in my name. People are going to come to faith because of you. People, people are going to be healed and brought back to life because of your ministry. But guys, guys, disciples, listen to this, listen to this. No matter what happens, no matter what the situation may be, it's about love. The love that you show to others will be the way that they know me. I could see Jesus continuing. He's like, hey guys, did you catch how I loved you? I washed your feet. I, I knelt down and to serve you and, and you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to lay my life down for you. It's like Jesus is saying, this kind of love and humility and service that I'm doing for you, I'm calling you to do. That's what it looks like to be really all in for me. And I feel like through this simple yet profound act, Jesus isn't just teaching us a lesson on humility. I believe he's showing us what it means to be all in. I mean, think about it. Jesus, the Son of God, he had all authority and he didn't stay on the sidelines. He could have said, this is not for me. I'm too important for this. This is beneath me. But no, he, he showed what a true disciple is all about. It's about rolling up your sleeves. And Jesus didn't just talk about serving. He lived it out. And I believe that's what is at the heart of being all in with Jesus. It's not just about believing the right things and showing up to church to be a spectator. It's about action. It's about taking the right theology that we may have and putting it into right practice. It's about being willing to take steps into the places that might feel uncomfortable, like Pastor Rex was talking about last week, and the places that might seem insignificant, and say, hey, I'm here to help, I'm here to serve. I mean, didn't Jesus himself say, I have set an example that you should do as I have have done for you. Another way to say that is, I've set you an example that you should serve as I have served you. Now, some of you have been going uh, to Grace Fellowship for anywhere between six months to like 16 plus years. You have a relationship with Jesus, like you've been growing in your relationship with Christ, but you haven't stepped off the sidelines. This message is for you. Other of you uh, volunteer, and you serve in multiple ways, in, in both inside and outside of the church. You make a difference in so many people's lives because of the way that you pour into them. This message is also for you, because being all in with Jesus means following Jesus' example. It means getting off the sidelines, rolling up your sleeves, and serving others in the same way that he served us, with love and with humility. And if you're not serving, being all in is not about waiting for the perfect opportunity or having the right feeling about it or, or feeling fully equipped and then you'll serve. It's about being, being willing to say, yes, God, I, I'm ready. Like, I don't feel ready, but I'll be ready. Like, I'm ready to step into the role that you've called me. And then if you are serving, if you do serve in some capacity, man, being all in is about maintaining the right posture before God as you serve others. But here's the thing. Are you ready for the thing? Knowing what it means to be all in and actually living it out are two very different things. It's like a firefighter 
who knows all about fire safety, and then she leaves the stove on when she leaves the house. It's like the TED Talk uh, speaker. He, he is the expert on time management in the world, and he speaks to millions of people because, on time management, but he always shows up late to his own seminars. Or it's like the football player who knows perfectly what it means. He, he can tell you exactly what it takes to be fit in the off-season, and yet he never goes to the gym. We see Jesus' example, and we understand the call to serve, but there's often a gap between what we know, what we believe, and what we do. We recognize the importance of of following Jesus' lead, yet when it comes to stepping up and serving, there's often a hesitation, some kind of disconnect. I mean, most of us agree that serving is important. In fact, Barna is a research, research organization, and they have studied the church and Christianity in America and, and globally, and they found that in the United States, 78% of devoted Christians believe that serving is the essential element for a meaningful experience at church. Did you catch that? 78% of devoted Christians believe that of all the things, Serving is at the top of the list for what it looks like to have a meaningful connection at church. That's even more people than believe small groups and studies is the most important thing. Serving is huge. But here's the paradox. When in-person services were put on pause during the pandemic, only 10% of Christians said that they missed serving. What What does that tell us? I think it tells us that being a person of conviction doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be a person of action. I think it shows us that it's, in the church today, it's really easy to be comfortable and to be a spectator rather than being a participant. We come to church, we hear the opportunities to serve, we see others getting involved. It's easy to stay in our comfort zone. And we might think, man, someone else will step up. I'm too busy, I'm too tired. Maybe I'm just not the right person for the job. And so we sit on the sidelines, we, we, we become content with watching, content with not fully being engaged. But here's where the tension lies. That the church is not meant to be a spectator sport. We're designed to be in a community where everyone plays a part where each of us is on mission. And the church can only move forward in that mission when people start to take ownership of their role. We know this, right? (laughs) But we still hold back. Why? Maybe it's a fear of failure. Maybe we just don't know where to start. Uh, Maybe we feel underqualified, like that feeling you get when you take your first child home from the hospital and you're like, "How how did they clear this? Like, they shouldn't have given me this. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I remember I was a volunteer in a youth ministry when I was in college, and on one Sunday morning, the youth pastor gave me the baton and said, hey, you're teaching our middle school and high schoolers this Sunday. And I was scared. Like, I didn't know what to do, and I I felt like, man, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough theology. I'm not cool. And these are middle school and high school students, and they're going to see right through me, and this is just... I remember standing in that hallway before going into the room and thinking, man, I need to pray. God, help me to be like that youth pastor. But what actually came out of my mouth was, Lord, help me to be the person you created me to be. Okay. (laughs) We have decided, those of us who have decided to follow Jesus, he he calls us to serve. And when he calls us to serve, he's going to qualify us. He's going to equip us. He's going to give us what we need so that we don't have to try to be someone else. I think God was trying to teach me something back then, and I think it's something that he continues to teach me today. Now, if we're being honest, there is another reason we're still holding back. And I think this reason comes in the form of a question. And it's a question that you may be thinking right now. It's a question that I often think in life. It's a question you might consider as you hear, okay, he's calling people to serve. Like, what is it? It's a question that is legitimate. And it comes from our human nature. The question is, what's in it for me? This mindset shows up in so many places 
in our lives. Think about it for a second. A colleague at work asks you for help on a project and you're thinking, okay, I can help them in this project, but what am I gonna get out of it? Like, is, the, is my supervisor going to see that I helped him even though it wasn't in my job description? Is, am I gonna get a recognition or a promotion or a raise of some sort? We do this with our spouse. They give us a call on the way home from work and said, hey, I forgot something at the store. Can you, can you pick it up on your way home? And you think, yeah, I can. What am I going to get myself to make this trip worth it, right? Has anybody thought that? Just me. Okay. Uh, in your relationships, we think, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife, we think, what am I going to get out of this? What, we focus on our own needs, our own expectations, and it even happens at church. We ask ourselves, hey, is this event going to be fun? <laughs> Will serving here benefit my relationship with God? Will there be food? If I attend this Bible study, will I finally find a spouse? Um, I can't answer that. But we focus so much on our return on investment, which is good in some areas, don't get me wrong. Uh, financially, you need to focus on the ROI in order to actually, you, you know, you're, if you didn't, you'd be not smart financially. Like, so there's good places to, to focus on the return on investment. But asking what's in it for me when it comes to being all in with Jesus is another way of asking how will I be served. And if we look at the life and teaching of Jesus, we'll see that his heart for the church, his heart for us is to flip that question upside down. He calls us not to have a heart to be served, but he, he calls us to have a heart to serve. Because here's the truth, uh, <laughs> we'll never be further in my belief, from the heart of Christ, then we show up somewhere and say, how can I be served? And on the flip side, I believe that we'll never be closer to the heart of Christ than when we show up and say, how can I serve? And there's a question you might be thinking. And the question might be, okay, so do I get nothing out of serving? Like I get zero, like there's no ROI, like I get nothing? That doesn't sound like a great deal to me, well, well, hold on, hold on, not exactly. Okay, so we shouldn't focus on what am I getting out of serving, but God does use serving to do something in us. When we go all in with Jesus through serving, God grows us and God actually deepens our relationship with him. So for the rest of our time this morning, we're gonna break down three ways in which serving actually transforms us and our walk with Christ. And the first is this. Serving recalibrates our focus. As Jesus was talking to some of his followers, there was these arguments going on, and he was like, okay, um, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Like, how, how are we, who's going to be sitting where, and how close are we, going to be, are we going to be with Jesus? And man, it's like two kids fighting over the best seat in the car. Have you ever experienced that? Like, I'm sure Jesus was rolling his eyes because he knew the heart of the matter and he says a brilliant response in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. He says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus completely <laughs> redefines greatness. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. In a world that is constantly telling us to focus on us, what our goals, our needs, our returns, Jesus is calling us to, to focus outward. Does anybody in the room have less than better, less than 2020 vision? Myself included? Okay. Everyone with glasses should be raising your hand. You know the feeling when you get a brand new pair of glasses and all of a sudden, Things, you put those glasses on and things just pop. Like you didn't realize how bad your eyes were getting until you get your new prescription. And you realize you were not seeing things as clearly as you are now. In the same way, when we shift our focus from, from ourselves to others, we stop obsessing over our own lives. And we start noticing the needs of others. I mean, it's, again, it's just like putting on a new pair of glasses. Our vision is recalibrated. Suddenly, we begin to see the world through Jesus' eyes, and we start seeing people the way that Jesus sees them. 
And we start to notice opportunities to serve and love and to make a difference in other people's lives. So as we serve, our, our focus, our vision is corrected. It shifts and we start seeing people the way Jesus sees them. And trust me, that, that changes everything. But that's not the only thing we get from serving. Serving also helps us uncover our gifts. At some point, we probably have all asked, what am I good at? What, what gifts do I have? What is my purpose in life? I love how Apostle, the Apostle Paul kind of gives us a clue on that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then later on in, in 1 Peter 4.10, kind of Peter kind of gives us a little bit more. He says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, God has a, has a plan for each and every one of us. Gifts that he's given to those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus. And he's prepared ways for us to use those gifts in his body. And if you're sitting here thinking today, like, I don't know what my gifts are. I don't know how God has gifted me. If you're a Christian, God has gifted you. But if you don't know what that looks like, man, I would love to invite you to a class. We're having a class. It's, it's called Discovering Your Design for Ministry. And it's happening on Sunday, November 17th from 11 to 3. You can sign up online and it's going to help you. It's designed to help you uncover the gifts that God has given you for serving. But here's the thing, <laughs> that class is over two months away. <laughs> November is not tomorrow. And uh, I don't want you to wait until you take the class to start serving because we don't, we don't just discover our gifts through a class. The class will help. Honestly, I think it's an amazing class. But I believe that we really discover our gifts when we just start to serve. And if you start to serve, and then take the class and discover the way that I'm serving is not matching up perfectly the, with the way that God has gifted me. Awesome. Stop serving in that way and change it up. The worst that has happened is that you've discovered something about yourself, and I believe that that is a win. And you've served for two months and got to know some people, and God has grown you through the process. Sign up for that class and start serving. And through those ways, I believe God is going to show you how he has gifted you for ministry. So serving recalibrates our focus. Serving helps us to uncover our gifts. And finally, serving transforms us and others. The 17th century author and poet Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson once said, it is one of the most beautiful compensations of life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. And I I, I tend to agree. Uh, as much as we need to stay away from the question of what's in it for me, the reality is when we serve others, we end up growing ourselves. Ephesians 4.16 says, From him, referring to Jesus, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Did you catch that? So each part does its job. Each part does the work that is prepared in advance for it to do. And as that happens, God grows his body, the church, you and me. No, no part of the body can operate independently. No, no body can, can independently function by itself. The same is true of the church. The Bible's clear that when we serve one another, God uses that to grow the church. And that's why we're here, right? There is a world in need of the gospel. There are neighbors and classmates, there are coworkers, and there are people in our families who need to know the love of God and the fact that Jesus has rescued them from sin. And when we use the gifts that God has given us to serve, God uses that to get his message out. He uses it to grow his kingdom. He uses that to grow his church. And that can't happen without us doing our job. That's on me. And that's on you. The Bible is also clear that when we serve one another, God uses that to grow us personally. 
I want to tell you a quick story about somebody who understands this. There's somebody in our church who can't make it physically in person to services because of, of their health. And they felt so disconnected from, from the body of Christ. But they understand that when you're in Christ, you're called to serve. And so we've had conversations with this person of like, what does it look like to serve when you're not physically here? And let me tell you, <laughs> this person serves beautifully. She ends up making crafts and gifts for kids. She makes blankets for those who are dedicated, for the parent-child dedications. She shares so much of the love of Christ through her life without even being physically present. She gets that she's a part of something bigger, that God has called her onto the field, and she does everything that she can with her own limitations to serve and love because that's what she has to do. And I can go on and on of stories of people who serve and get so much more out of serving that they, than they ever thought. Like I can tell you stories about kids ministry volunteers and youth ministry volunteers who go and show up and, and go to teach kids about Jesus but end up walking away knowing so much more about God themselves. They're, I guess, I mean, Jesus was right when he said it's better to give than to receive. And when Jesus, um, when, when Jesus calls us to serve and we step into that and we say yes, he, he recalibrates everything in our lives. He recalibrates our focus. We, he recalibrates the way that we see ourselves and the gifts and he, he allows us to see how we have been gifted and then he transforms us in the process. So at the end of the day, I guess there is a lot in it for me. <laughs> there is a return. So when we wrap up, as we wrap up today, um, I want to take us back to that NFL opening game, right? Kansas City and Baltimore. The energy is there. The excitement is off the charts. The thrill of being a part of something bigger than yourself is right there. The game isn't meant to be watched from the stands. The real action, the real growth, the real transformation happens when you step onto the field the real growth happens when you pick up the ball. And that is exactly what Jesus is inviting us into. He, he's not calling us to be spectators of the faith. He, he's not calling us to sit back and watch others serve and grow. He's calling us to be participants. To catch the ball when it's necessary. <laughs> He's calling us to serve others with the same love and humility that he showed to us. So here's my challenge for you today. Don't stay on the sidelines. Pick up the ball and get into the game. Find a way to serve. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be in huge ways. You might not understand fully what it means, but like just get into some place to serve. Start where you are, start with what you have, and allow God to work in you and through you. Maybe, maybe for you, this looks like stepping into a ministry here at Grace Fellowship. It could look like greeting people at the front doors and helping people who are coming into our church understand that this is a place where they can belong. This is a family where they can grow, and it is, it's good that they're here because someone greeted them with a smile and a hello. Maybe it looks like jumping in with our kids' ministry or our youth ministry and helping the next generation hold on to a faith in Jesus, helping them understand what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ, looks like what, understand what it looks like to, to live in response to the gospel in everyday life. Maybe you have a passion for coffee. Maybe you jump into our cafe team and you help people stay caffeinated so they can listen to the sermon. <laughs> an amazingly important ministry here at Grace Fellowship. <laughs> Maybe you're musically or inclined or you like technology. Man, we're always looking for new people to join our worship and production teams to help us experience it and create a, a really great, uh, meaningful worship on Sunday mornings. We need people to come in midweek and clean the facility. Believe it or not, ministry happens in our building six days a week this fall. And there are teams of people who come in and make it ready. Maybe you're not ready for a recurring commitment. Like you just want to like test the waters. You just want to see what it's like. 
I'd love to invite you to sign up for a serve day we're calling Serve as One. It's happening on Saturday, September 28th. It's just in the morning, literally less than half a day commitment, but you get to work alongside others to serve our community partners. Specifically in our area, that means walking alongside Captain at, the, at Cheryl's Lodge and at the teen uh, youth shelter or, or serving Mechanicville, community, Mechanicville Area Community Services Center and helping them uh, get ready for their fall. You can sign up online at serveas.one, not our website, but serveas.one. We'd love for you to serve and sign up to serve in this way. But believe it or not, all the opportunities I just mentioned just scratch the surface of the service opportunities we have here at Grace Fellowship. In fact, I want to show you a chart. 147 people. That's what you see on there, broken down by ministry. That's how many volunteers it takes to make ministry happen each week here at Grace Fellowship Half Moon. So if you're wondering how you can get plugged in around here, there are 147 opportunities waiting for you. And you're looking around, you're like, okay, between the two services, I'm pretty sure there's a, more than 147 people here on a Sunday. Yeah, but people don't serve every week. 147 people to make sure that our kids are understanding the gospel, that our, our, our teenagers are holding on to the faith that they have in Jesus that we can have coffee, again, important, so that we can lead people in worship, so that we can do admin and facilities things throughout the week. If you're wondering how can I get plugged in, we've got space for you. In fact, take the Connect card out that was mentioned earlier, like take it out from the seat back in front of you. You're not doing it. Take the connection card out from the seat back in front of you and hold it up. Okay, we got 60% of people doing it. Let's go. Turn it over. On the back, it says next steps. I want to run out of these cards this week. I want to have to order new cards for next Sunday because I want you to check volunteering on the back of that card and then put your information on the front of that card. And I want to get you plugged in this week. Fill that out. Take it to the info center after the service to give it to another one of our volunteers uh, who's going to help you get connected. Or, or give it to a staff member. Or I understand some people don't want to talk to anyone. Put it in the offering boxes at the exits and we will find it this week. Because if, if you're in Christ, you are called to serve. So uh, again, I want to run out of these cards this week. It's not a problem that there's an empty space in the chair. Because when you serve... You're not just filling a spot or checking a box. You're stepping into your true purpose. You're discovering your gifts. You're experiencing transformation that comes from, from following Jesus' example. And as you serve, you'll find that God is going to do something in you. He's going to not just impact other lives because of the way you serve. He's going to change your life as well. So let's be a church that is all in. Let's be a community where, where everyone is involved, where each of us is playing our part and where we're growing in our love and our maturity in Christ together. So the game is on and there's a place for you on the field. Will you take it? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have allowed us to read it and grow and be changed by it. Lord, we thank you for, for giving those who are in you gifts through your spirit. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to partner with you. God, I pray that we would be a church that uses the gifts that you give. Help us to step outside of our comfort zones. Help us to step into the calling you have on our lives to serve and to love, not to expect anything in return, but simply because you call us to do it. Lord, I ask that you would use this church body to make more and better disciples. The mission is too great for us just to sit and watch. Lord, your church is your plan A with no other plan B. 
So would you work in us and through us and grow us? Amen. Well, like I said, I would love for you to fill out those cards. would love for you to, in some capacity, let us know that you're interested in serving. And I would love for you to come back next week because at the end of our service next week, we're going to have a fall ministry fair. And this is an opportunity for you to get to know some of the small groups and studies that are happening this fall, but also to talk to ministry leaders and say, hey, what is it like to serve? How can I serve? What are the opportunities? And next Sunday, we would love to plug you in. But like I said, don't wait till next Sunday. Let us know you're interested today so we can start processing with you what that looks like. Because the mission of God is too great for us to sit by the sidelines. God has called us to something great. He's called us to grow. He's called us to love and to serve. And for now, I'd love for you to stand with us as we continue to worship, as we continue to sing praises to God and declare, man, God, would you build our lives on you? Let's worship together.